even before the alcohol. It's not exactly functioning today. Hey, it happens. Let's roll that intro. Well, what you got tonight? I am drinking Thornberry Pear Apple Cider. Deep into the ciders again. <sighs> I know, it's a bit of a crutch. It's what was in my fridge. I have a bunch of stuff that I acquired over the holidays that hasn't made it to the fridge yet. It's not mm. like canned stuff. It's a lot of bottled stuff. But a lot of it is like, I don't know what to do with it. There's a weird coffee liqueur. There's uh, like an authentic Mexican tequila that my mom brought back from I went to Mexico the last time. Uh, there's, I can't remember the name, but it's like a butter tart liqueur. Oh. Uh, I, I don't know what to do with that. I mean, it sounds tasty. I'm sure it would be. I don't know if it's the kind of thing I would be, you know, drinking on this show, but. Well, I mean, we've turned the cameras off, so it's it's okay if your pants fall off. Wait, you wear pants? Uh, well, I don't know. I, the camera doesn't show below the desk. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I have released the Kraken. It's what I got in the cupboard. Yes. Yeah, I have three or four little bottles of stuff that uh, that Cindy went and grabbed for me and just sort of cycling through them as the mood strikes. Ah, so we played some D&D. We did. I figured we should do some table talk right up front because the rest of this show is probably going to go sideways. Seems likely. So we played some D&D. We did. I, um, and I don't know if I want to uh, you know, talk about the switch to Foundry first, or if I want to hear what Shane wants to talk about, because I'm, I'm a little worried that might be the end of the episode. Yes, we've got a new beef. Oh, no. No. Uh, no, something did happen last episode that I think it's worth talking about. I'm not mad. Okay. But it is the kind of thing that I, I think it was a complete accident. But I know that other players would be mad at had it happened to them. Okay. I need to set it up. Because otherwise, nobody's going to understand. In our past games that you ran, I think I was probably the most experienced of the players. Most of the players were pretty new uh, in our group. Great players, but quite passive. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of talking. A lot of trying to lead without leading, like so that we're not all sitting here and doing nothing. It's, you know, suggestion here, suggestion here, whatever, just to try and point things in some direction. And one of your objectives starting this new campaign was to try and get other players out of their shell. Yep. So you had some archetypes in mind. You were going to have players play that would challenge their, um, get them out of their comfort zone. Yep. That was the plan. And my part your request was, doesn't talk very much. Mm -hmm. And I decided to lean into it. I made it a part of my character. You leaned into it hard. I did. Now, I have to say, whether you, you've probably clued into what we're talking about here now. But I think so, yeah. You did something, and I understand why you did it, because I was in this weird position where I was having my cake and eating it too. <laughs> a little bit. My character bug, his basic background was that it was like a Groot situation right like he just he said two or three words that's he could he could kind of communicate he tried to emote did some hand stuff to try and get some basic ideas across and as we've played the game i've pushed the boundary of the type of things i've been communicating with that as a player <laughs> i've been saying yeah and bug you know he waves his hands around and you sort of take that to mean yeah Something that obviously I wouldn't be able to communicate that way. And and I, I get that you recognize that. I recognize that I was doing it. <laughs> uh, but it was my intention to take that aspect of Bug, because he was sort of a mysterious character, and hope that that turned into something. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, He has some weird behaviors that were part of his minimal backstory that he was doing things, and really that would be a mystery. He couldn't come out until you know he couldn't really communicate too well about it. But halfway through last session... Uh, Telson, as Dungeon Master, just said, actually, Bug, you can talk now. I, 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 okay, I, I got I to gotta dial you back a little bit there, because something happened, and I don't, oh. know, if, I don't know if you if you guys clued into it, because it, I was trying to be really subtle about it, and it may, mm -hmm. it may come back later. So I'm not going to spell it out. 
No. But what happened was, is that you, you did the, I gesture and say over there. And I think to myself, this, that, and the other thing. And I point that way. Mm -hmm. And what I said was, you realize doing your habitual thing where you gesture and point, nod your head, but you've said all of that out loud. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just, Hey bug, you can talk now. No, it wasn't. But the mechanics of it is that it kind of was. Kind of, yeah. Mechanically, yes. And typically speaking with a player DM relationship, that kind of thing would be the thing that you would plan together, both agree that that's the direction you're going. It wouldn't be a surprise to, to either one. And that just wasn't the case this time. Now, as I said, I'm not mad about it. <laughs> like the character was a bit of a meme character anyway, and I recognized that I was I was pushing things in a direction where I was... You were having my cake and eat it too. I was, I was effectively talking anyway, Yeah, but also that it was, it's a bit that doesn't have a long lifespan. Yeah. So as DM, you, you probably got to that point where you're like, oh, well, you know, we can, we can fix this issue. And you, you, you fixed it sort of. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't so much that it needed to be fixed or that I was looking to fix it. It was, it was, I was searching for ways to kind of express uh what was happening because i know like there's a couple of there's there's a, a half a dozen sort of uh breadcrumbs that are out there and i know that some of them have been very very subtle mm -hmm. um and like I'll, I'll circle back to that it's basically like foreshadowing and later on it'll be oh that's what that was about mm -hmm. um but sort of that moment I, I needed some way to to highlight the fact that something special happened um, I have to say though, that I've come up with like a, a few things where I'm like, I, like, I have to give kudos to all of you as players where I've, I've done some things thinking, I don't know if they're going to figure this out or if they're going to get this right. And like, I'm, I ha I'm having to, I think I may have mentioned before that I've had troubles in the past where I present puzzles to players and they just, mm -hmm. they, it's, it's like they have brain freeze and they just stop. I'm, I'm having to readjust. Uh, puzzles and clues for this group of people because I'll throw clues out there thinking, wow, it'll, you know, be a couple of sessions before they figure this out. And it's 30 seconds later and you guys have figured it out. So there's, there's a little bit of, of, you know, sort of balancing and jumping back and forth happening on my end as well. So I, I was hoping that you wouldn't be upset by that because it wasn't, it was not me saying like, okay, Shane, for God's sake, just talk. It was just like, it's, it's this point in the development, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm not going to suggest that I would like, depending on how you want to play the character, it's your character. But my no. suggestion would be he's still not really talkative. But and, and, and that's completely fair. And I'm not mad. <laughs> I wanted to discuss it, though, because I'm going to assume you wouldn't have done that to one of the other players. Probably not. Um, chances are reasonably good, though, that the other players wouldn't have tried to uh, to push Mm -hmm. uh, not talking that much. It's, it's one of the reasons why if somebody suggests I'd like to play a Kenku that I will say, you know what? Kenku don't exist in this world. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause it's, it's just, it's impossible to pull that off for more than about one session. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I do have to say like, I, I enjoyed bug in his non-speaking capacity. Um, but I, I just, I feel like the, he needs to communicate a little bit more than he has been. That's totally fair. And I would assume then that with another player, if they were in that situation, you would have had a conversation with them saying, hey, I get what you're doing here, but are you OK with leaning? You know, let's mm. let's change this up a little bit. Well, maybe and maybe not. I think probably what would happen because most of the time, like, honestly, I did that off the cuff. Like, I didn't have that planned ahead of time. OK, um, but I would have this conversation. Or at least I would hope that, you know, the players would reach out and say like, hey, this this is kind of going in a direction I don't want my character to do. Um, and if that was the case, like if we were having this conversation and you were like, I, I really don't want Bug to be able to talk, then, you know, like you'd wake up the next morning and go, well, suddenly Bug isn't talking anymore. It was just it was a momentary thing that happened. Yeah, I was I was curious. It was one of those things that in a vacuum, only looking at it from what I witnessed, I think other players would have had their feathers a little more ruffled at than I did. It's possible. Yeah. So I was curious where you were coming from, whether you'd put any forethought into it or whether it was just an off the cuff thing. 
it was an off the cuff thing where I thought like this is really going to highlight that something something special has happened here. And I, I think it did it. Like I, I tried to lean into that a little bit better, so my 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 conversation went kind of the other extreme a little bit. Mm. It's like, oh, bugs this complex intellectual. <laughs> I might not have the stats to pull it off, but you know, <laughs> the way I was engaging the, the the siren girl and stuff like that, it was a little bit flowery in the language, trying to sound like, oh, this has always been bug. He just couldn't articulate it in a way that everybody else could understand at this time and. It's um, almost like, and I hesitate to say this because I'm not uh, like I'm really not sure that it's true. But if you think about um, like like people on the autism spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. And that there's there's no doubt for in a lot of cases that there's like there's thoughts happening. There's there's great intellectual stuff, maybe maybe not, but communicating that becomes difficult. So it would be interesting if if. At some point in the future, you know, we discover a way to to remove that block, and I wonder if it would be like bug coming out from. I really can't communicate. To suddenly, I'm using five dollar words. Entirely possible. Uh, I don't know. That was that's what I wanted to talk about. I didn't, okay. you know, wasn't looking to start a fight. We're not, you know, enemies again. <laughs> My personal okay. nemesis. Yeah, that's me. I work real hard at that kind of stuff. You know, I, I always thought you did. Ah, that's, and that, that, well, here's a funny thing. Like I try real hard or, or I, I did, I try less hard now because I find it's not easier, healthier. I used to try really hard to make everybody like me. And as a consequence, a lot of people didn't. Mm -hmm. So now I, I try to be me. And if you like me, great. And if you don't, sorry. If nothing else, one thing that incident does demonstrate is just how difficult it is to be a DM. It's it's tough because like I I honestly had no clue that you would be upset by that, and I wasn't. Again, but, I, I want to be no it stuck sure. out. Right. It's 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 one of those things where you can sort of highlight someone could be upset by this, yeah. right? And that literally just went like right over my head. Tanya and I had a conversation after the session. She's like, "Oh." So you talk now, you know, you and Telson had that cooked up. You, you know, you weren't telling me. I was like, no, nope. it's a complete surprise to me, but whatever. Yeah, it's, it's difficult because sometimes there's like, as the DM, you kind of want to give a little push, right? And sometimes the pushes are, hey, this just moves the story along and it's good. And it's what you were thinking about your character. And sometimes it's like, this just doesn't feel right, man. So, you know, uh, regardless, sometimes, sometimes I'm going to get it wrong. And if I do, we just, we got to talk and. Fix it after the fact. And that's the important part. One, it's tough to be a DM. Two, they're not always going to get it right. You need to talk. Yeah. You know, it doesn't need to be adversarial. You don't need to turn it into beef. <laughs> I mean, you can if you want to make a podcast out of it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah my online nemesis. Um, but also, like, just appreciate your DM. You know, they're putting in the work. They're in the trenches. They're they're going to make mistakes and not even realize it sometimes. Or not even mistakes. Just they're going to deviate from maybe your expectation of where something should go. And maybe some of that conversation is reining it in or trying to find that middle ground that works for both of you. But some of it is just saying, "Hey, tell me what you're thinking. Where where do you see this going? Because I might like it." Yeah, it's possible. There are boundaries, and we need to talk about them because everybody doesn't know where everyone else's boundaries are. This recommendation comes to you from two people in the world who hate people and would rather go through life not talking to anyone. I don't talk to very many people. I have, on average, about three conversations a week, and it's wonderful. Is Dungeons & Dragons our like social construct just so that we have that in our lives? Yes. I, I find it much easier to relate to people if I'm playing someone else while I'm doing it. I don't know if that's impressive, clever, or incredibly pathetic. I all, all yes. of the above. <laughs> yeah, wrap that up in a ball and put a bow on it. Let's let's throw that question out to our wives. Are we pathetic? Oh God, don't ask our wives that question. You know the answer. <laughs> if we're pathetic, like if we're not, subscribe. Yeah, there you go. Do we have likes and subscribes? Uh, not so much anymore. <laughs> I mean, sign up for our Patreon and buy a t-shirt. <laughs> All right. In serious D&D &D talk, though, uh, it was a big weekend for us. For you. It was huge. We've uh, migrated our game away from the evil 
unruly, terrible Roll20 environment to Foundry. And it's amazing how long that it took you to get here. Uh, it was mostly about the money. And I mean, it's a ridiculously small amount of money when you think about the amount of time that we spend playing D&D. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my goal, I would, I would like to roll back the evil and, and unruly and horrible. Roll 20 is fine. It's a great free option um, if you're just looking for a place to draw arrows and squares on a map and put some tokens down. It's great. It is not what it once was. No, it is definitely, it's archaic. And, and one of the things I want to talk about, about uh, switching to Foundry, is just how different it is from the DM's perspective in setting up. So I'm, I'm hosting it locally here, and you were originally worried that my bandwidth wasn't going to be good enough. I was. It's a, it's a fair um, concern, considering that your internet is like a big fat pipe, and mine is a drinking straw. And I was less worried about the raw throughput. Like I thought your upload speed would have been enough, but you have stability issues with your wireless internet. And I was worried that packet loss and things like that would lead to unexpected behaviors. It was less about it being slow and more about WebSocket connections just dropping and, and connectivity issues and stuff like that. But knock on wood, session one. Everything worked great. Yeah. And, and I'm hosting it on... Well, do you remember do you remember when I asked you about replacing Cindy's laptop? I do. It was 2 years ago? Year plus going on 2. Yeah. yeah. It's going on 2. Ago. And like it, it was 5 or 6 years old at that time. Basically the hard drive crapped out and I thought it was the hard drive controller based on the uh, uh the behavior that I was seeing. Mm -hmm. Right. So I basically just like folded it up and put it in a corner and she got her new laptop and it worked. So yeah, away we go. Um, so I'm running it on that laptop, which is, it's a Core 2 Duo. Like, it's old. It is quite old. And it's fine. The relative specs of that versus, uh, like, a cloud web server uh, would shock you how, how powerful that is. Well, it's, it's got a little bit less RAM than quite a few of the, the options that I've seen. But again, it's enough. Sure, but you know, you think of how, how web servers typically, like virtual private servers, work. You've got you know a rack, you've got server, and then you're you're running a bajillion virtualized containers on that. Each of those only representing a small percentage of what those resources are. Right, and you just hope they're not all making requests at once. I'm paying for it's not premium VPS, but it's like the premium tier, next level up from the basic one. Uh, with DigitalOcean and like, what are my specs? Two gigs of RAM. It is running an SSD. Uh, I'm running uh, two virtual CPU cores on probably like an AMD Epic processor or something like that. And if you look at the specs of that, what you're running is quite favorable. Like, you know, the, there's not going to be a clear winner in that situation at all. I did. I did figure. I don't know if I mentioned to you as well. I uh, I I found the very first. SSD that I ever bought. It's 128 gigs, I think, which I'm not sure is enough for Windows 10. I'll have to, I don't know. I, here's another funny, so here's a, here's a funny nerd topic. I installed Windows 10 on this laptop. That is the first time that I have installed Windows in 10 plus years. Do you remember when we used to do it once every couple of months? Oh God, sometimes once a week. <laughs> Windows XP, like every other week, it was, uh, it's not working, reinstall. Especially like in the LAN party days, it's like, oh, I got a LAN party coming up next weekend. You know what? I'm just going to wipe it, start fresh. May as well. I mean, you're going to pick up some viruses anyway. Part of it was that we were so much more experimental back then. Like we were always yeah. trying software and shit and like fiddling with settings. And we were also things. swapping hardware in and out a lot. And like there yeah. wasn't, we didn't have things like, um, display driver on installer ddu to do like a clean wipe of drivers right so you happen to jump from say an ati video card at the time to an nvidia one you were better off wiping windows and and doing a clean driver install and starting from scratch rather than trying to sloppily remove the old driver and install a new one on top of it yeah yeah exactly so uh foundry uh the switch the biggest difference that i have found between because i think they're both sort of web-based things the biggest thing that i have found as a as a sort of a dungeon master user of the the software is that when i'm trying to figure out okay how do i do this in foundry 
it's usually, okay, where would I go? There. Okay. Oh, and there it is. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, and I do it. And when I go looking for it in Rule 20, it's, okay, I got to search for how does one do this? And then like there's 17 answers from 17 years ago that are, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you know, here's an API thing that you have to pay for. That's a paid tier thing or, you know, write your own macro to make it happen. Um, it just, it feels better, right? Like mm-hmm. it's very much a, a tactile uh, kind of uh, like, it's just like you click on something. It's like, okay, that did what I expected as opposed to roll 20 where you click and you hope that something happens. We should talk about your journey to get here. For context, I've been using Foundry VTT for my games for like a couple of years now. And I've been trying to sell this thing to Telson forever and ever. And when he was considering moving away to Roll20 to look at different options, I'm like, dude, you want to go Foundry? And he started going off in a different direction with something that isn't even a VTT. He's like, well, you know what? I like how it does the map stuff. So maybe I can just invent the VTT part of it or invent the D&D I, system well, part of it. Hang on a second. I was talking about map tools. And <laughs> if you're a tinkerer, if you're a tinkerer, map tools is a great solution. Um, it's all, it's old though. Like it's showing mm-hmm. its age now. Um, I, like I used it once upon a time way back in the day and it is a VTT and there's all kinds of mm. like plugins and stuff for it, but it doesn't have any official support support from anyone. So everything is homebrewed and it's all in Java and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. So no, it wasn't a great thing. Um, it's a funny thing that you mentioned, you've been trying to sell me on it because I remember when I was first thinking of switching and I was sending you links to all kinds of stuff and foundry was one of the ones that I sent to you. I don't remember that. Yeah. That's how you got onto foundry. Cause you're like, I like this thing. I think I'm going to, you know, spring for it and see how it works. Yeah. Okay. I remember that conversation, but I don't remember that it was you that sent it to me. I was pretty sure it was the other way around, but I, you, you may have sent a, you, you may have found it previous to me sending it to you, but it was definitely among that batch okay. of things that I was sending it to you. Yeah. I just, I found it comical that you were, you went from roll 20, which was this thing doesn't perform too well. And to do what I want, it's like 16 steps and I can't find where it is that I need to go to do the thing to map tools, which is okay. I kind of like the core functionality despite its age, but all of those things that I'm having a hard time finding in roll 20, this just doesn't do. So I'm going to have to invent it. Uh, well, okay. The major thing about map tools that I, I wanted over, um, there's there's another thing to get into here as well, which I'll I'll do after this. But um, the major thing that Map Tools had that Roll Twenty doesn't is that Roll Twenty is on someone else's server. They're in control of it. It's their service. They own everything. And Map Tools, like Foundry, for here because there are other other ways to run it, mm-hmm. is sitting on a computer right over there, right? And that's what what Map Tools. That's why Map Tools was attractive to me. Was like everything is going to be mine. And then I immediately found out. I don't have time for this. <laughs> I just oh, don't. I would like character sheets. I'll just oh, make those. I would, I would like rolling functionality, rolling dice. That'd be great if this did that. Map tools <laughs> rolls dice by default. There's a, there's a, it's just, it doesn't do it graphically. It's, it, it <laughs> oh, is. Sorry. <laughs> hang on. It is, it is the original. Um, it's like, it's like IRC with a map, yes. right? Like it is the original simple and it's great if, first of all, if you have access to your router, which I don't. My ISP has locked that down completely. Um, it's funny. My my uh, my uh, IP address that is given to my router is a 192 number. Like, literally, the town has an intranet that mm-hmm. is connected to the internet. <laughs> so, which is fine. I mean, it's run by volunteers and all of the profits go to the local hospital. So I really have no objections. Yes, it is an unconventional situation for sure. It is. And it, I mean, it, I just, I got a socket tunnel thingy and it was free. So nah. And if that stops working, I'll do something else. You spent, I want to say it was like six weeks tinkering with map tools. And every once in a while, you'd be like, oh, look at this thing that I did. And then eventually you got like Ian and I joining uh and you spent two hours just trying to get a connection to work joining your game to try some stuff that was mostly broken and when you finally 
decided to pull the trigger and go with Foundry. We were talking about it. We were looking at different hosting uh, is options. This, is this where you're going to ask me to eat crow? Because I that's, no, no, that's the not next eating thing. crow. I just it's 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 just funny because you went from yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to finally get it. I'm going to look at hosting options. You were talking about whether I could host it for you at this point. To like six hours later that night, you were like, "Oh no, I've got a license. I'm, I've, it's already set up. It's amazing." No, it is really, it is really well put together. So I do, I do have to eat a little bit of crow because one of the things that I said when we first started this foundry thing was I, I'd like to run sort of um, mod light at the beginning, right? To try and avoid adding a whole bunch of things into it. Um, and at current, I have 30 modules active. Mm, which is actually more than me. Um, I have, well, there's a couple of things I've got. Um, I've got a lot of the ones that you recommended. I think I skipped two of them. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's, there's just a cut. There's a couple of them that are literally, I don't like it when I click it, it does this. When I click it, I want it to do that instead. And there's a module for that. And for, for those of you that either haven't used Foundry or don't know what a virtual tabletop is, um, it's Google whiteboard. Yeah. The development ethos for this particular virtual tabletop is, Let's nail the basic functionality that people are looking for really, really well and have a great ecosystem for third party add ons. Yeah. And historically, it's worked really well. It's funny because you're actually coming into using Foundry at the worst possible time. Yeah, because 5e just launched. Yeah. So normally, when they make big changes like that, they're announced in advance like it's literally like version 12 foundry has been running through different sort of levels of alpha and beta testing so that documentation changes and, and proposed changes are available so add-on developers have the ability to get their work done ahead of time before something hits the actual release channel right and this partnership with uh, wizards of the coast was a complete surprise so there was none of that and they did a substantial overhaul of the D D 5e system to make it the official system. I like a lot of the changes that they've made, but none of the add-on developers had time to react in advance. So they've been scrambling and some of them are still scrambling. So the greatest strength of Foundry, which is let's do this lean thing really, really well and have this ecosystem so that you can pick and choose the functionality that you'd like so that it's not forced on you, is also its greatest weakness in that when an instance like this happens, you have to be strategic about things like, when am I updating? What's going to break when I update? Am I performing backups before I do my updating so that I can roll back if something breaks? Now, that's good practice for almost anything yeah, technology-wise, but, wise, but the, the, the important part of that aspect is you're not forced into doing anything. I'm not running the new system in my game. It'll probably be months before I roll the new system out for, for my main game because I want to make sure that a, it's going to be solid. I might actually do the wipe Windows XP and reinstall approach and actually build a new world just so I can clean up some stuff anyway. Like I've been running this campaign for going on a couple of years now, but like that's Foundry in a nutshell, I guess. Like you, you get the, 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 the stuff that Roll20 was terrible at, the lighting system, the performance of even just moving tokens around on the map canvas, the... The experience of doing that. Like what Roll20 does well and Foundry isn't quite there yet is that Roll20 has had official content from Wizards of the Coast. So you want to run Curse of Strahd. You just buy it. That does exist for other systems. Uh, Pathfinder has been a partner with uh, Foundry VTT for a long time. And if you're into Pathfinder 2E stuff, you're going to find a lot of stuff available for you. A lot of the 5e stuff, um, people have had to dance around the edges of things like copyright or using something like you're using now where, yes, we're paying for this material through D&D Beyond and there's this third-party module that makes it really easy to pull those character sheets in mm -hmm. uh, to get that 5e material. And I'm excited by the fact that some of what Roll20 has had going for it, I hope is going to eventually find its way into this virtual tabletop. Mm -hmm. Because when you take a developer that has the clear vision that these guys have and the talent to execute on it and give them a little bit of money. It, let's just hope that they don't go the route that, that some do where they're like, well, we, 
We have money now, so let's add feature after feature after feature after feature. Let's fulfill all of our dreams. Yeah, that would be in stark contrast to their entire approach. So I, I'm not too worried about it going that way. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, hey, one, one significant lead developer leaves and gets replaced and maybe that all changes. But so far. So far, so good. So what was the experience of running the game like for you then? Um, it was pretty good. I, I, I mentioned that like uh, at one point, like there was there was a room that I had not. I literally thought you guys are not going to go into that room and you did. So I had to actually populate it. Mm -hmm. And I did that while you guys were having the conversation. Um, and it's worth noting that, I mean, I have some experience with a, a lot of different kinds of software. Um, so I'm not, I'm not fumbling around a lot, but if I had to do that in roll 20, it would have been entirely theater of the mind. I wouldn't have even bothered. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in foundry it was like you know here's the character uh the the npc there's a full npc sheet there's the uh like token that tokenizer program is really great once you figure it out mm -hmm. or module i guess um but until you figure it out it's damn confusing um oh the one thing that i wanted to to bring up about the reason that i hesitated going to foundry for a good long time was my brain is still stuck in 2008 where i think oh my god this program costs 50 dollars like the, it's 50 dollars man i i roll 20 is free right like do i really want to pay 50 dollars for something which is ridiculous free without most of the features yeah yeah i mean everything that you want to do in roll 20 costs money pretty much unless you want to use it as a whiteboard we both have jobs where our hour spent doing anything has a monetary value assigned to it. Yeah. Time is quite literally money for both of us. And I mean, I, I get that way too sometimes, right? I wouldn't say that I go down on the, I'm going to spend six weeks trying to hack map tools to get it to do what I want to save 50 bucks, but I get it. I'm not that much better. Some of the some of the hacking on map tools was not so much to save money. It was just, hey, this is neat. I could learn something. Sure, sure. But I get but there that was too. but there was definitely a, a, a component of I'm starting this because I want to save fifty bucks, which is, I mean, if you like throwing fifty dollars away, that's a bad idea, right? It was it was difficult for me to see before I started like the value that that fifty dollars was going to get me. Mm -hmm. um, I spent uh, setting up. How many maps have I got? Uh, I have, because they, they call them scenes. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, things, sort of scenes that I set up. Uh, and they're not complete by any means. Like uh, four or five of them are, are just sort of bare bones. Like there's a map. I've done the lighting. Oh, the lighting is amazing, by the way. Drawing walls and stuff is awesome. You need a couple of modules to make it really, really dance. Um, and there's that one architect module that I'm really, really hoping that they actually update because it's not working for version 11. Um, but it's just got so many things in it. And that's one thing I haven't played with any of the, the third party functionality. I've been using the stock settings and stock uh, features for drawing walls and invisible walls and windows and all of that stuff. And even that out of box is great. It is. It's good. The only thing I was having trouble with was uh, joining things up. Mm -hmm. um, so what I ended up with was Monk's Wall Enhancement, the guy called Iron Monk who, who made that. And it, it literally just does, you can double click to put a new node in a wall, mm -hmm. um, which I turned off because I double click in order to change walls into doors. Mm -hmm. um, but if you hold, uh, you hold control, and that's a stock functionality, you can just like lay down walls and they're all joined up. Um, with monks, if you hold down control and start from another wall, it, it continues on. And if you click close to an end point of another wall, it joins them up. And then when you drag them, it drags them all at once, which is super nice. I'll be honest. I actually haven't done a ton of lighting stuff recently. Um, one of my regular players is playing on like rural internet wireless connection. And I found that. Generally, Foundry works okay for her, but once I start enabling things like lighting and stuff where the polling rate's going to go up, 
her Discord just craps out. Uh, so I tend to shy away from that, but I do want to get into doing more. Like I haven't, I haven't done a real heavy dungeon crawl with those guys. Some of the stuff that I want to do for the paid games, I'm actually looking at doing almost like a hex crawl type thing. Mm -hmm. And then some of that will lead to like some dungeon dive kind of stuff. So I'm going to get back into it. I'm probably going to check out some of those, those add ons. There's uh yeah, it's, I'm shocked. I've got 30 mods in here and it's, I, I've had one crash. Um, and it was probably more to do with, uh, you know, like the hardware than it was anything else. And that'll work as long as you're super strategic about doing your updates and backing up before you do and mm -hmm. being patient. If you're just the kind of person that's going to be like, Ooh, updates are available. Click. Yeah. You're, there's, you're going to struggle with foundry in that regard. You're not that kind of guy. Well, sometimes I am. There's an update staring at me in the face right now. And I'm like, I want to do it. But yesterday at 4.39 p.m., Telson in Discord, quote, I want Windows XP back. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that kind of guy anymore. Oh, no, I'm not. But I was I was um, fiddling about with trying to do something. And I forget what the hell it was. I think it was network involved. And I'm just like, okay, so there's all of this stuff. And I'm not really in that world anymore, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, I set up the, I was, I, like, I spent probably three hours going, like, how do I actually get people to connect to my computer without being able to do port forwarding? And there's all of these things where it's, you can set up this and pay for that. And you can do this other thing and you can sign up with these guys and then you can do this. And then there's, there's SSH tunnels and like reverse SSH tunnels. And I'm like, okay, what are those? And here's how you set one up. And here's the software software you download. And you just run a Node.js and then do this and use this command. I'm like, what does it do? What does it do? <laughs> I just I just want to play. In the end, there's a there's a um, there's a website called playit.gg, which is basically a socket tunnel of some kind. And you literally sign up for an account, click on a couple of things, and it goes. You're allowed to connect now. So it was it was pretty simple. I thought the game went well. The players adapted for the most part. There's going to be some learning curve. It helps that some of them have used Foundry playing the games that I was running. Mm -hmm. Rich, who hasn't used it, seemed to adapt quite quickly. Smart enough guy, yeah. He does IT for a living. It's like, oh, this is just a computer. Which button do I push to make it do what I want? Not that one, not that one, not that one. Ooh, that's an interesting thing. I'll remember that for later. That one! he pull the the mixed Ravik approach where he just sort of hisses into a microphone for a while and the computer does what he wants <laughs> yeah pretty much i mostly work at i this is going to sound really strange i work with older people mostly so people who are my age <laughs> and whenever i do something with a computer they'll they'll call me up because i'm the the sort of de facto it guy in the office in our in our home office they'll reach out to me and say like this is happening can you fix it and i'll be like i don't know i'll have a look and my approach like it's always been is literally to look at it go what's happening does pushing this button help no how about this one this one that one oh hey it worked right and everyone's like oh my god you're like a you know a computer whisperer and you know all this stuff and i'm like i know a few things but mostly i just push buttons until it does what i want <laughs> It's like the, the old uh, troubleshooting flowchart. Does it move? Yes. Is it supposed to? No. Duct tape. <laughs> Does it move? No. Is it supposed to? Yes. WD-40. <laughs> That's the entire chart. <laughs> That's the whole chart. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of old men. Oh, God. We had some limited conversation this week about what do we want to talk about our next show? And I had a few ideas for topics where it's like, oh, that's involved. That's going to be boring. And I've had a tough week. So I thought, wouldn't it be therapeutic to just do an old men yelling at clouds episode? Do you know what really grinds my gears? Yeah. Uh, so my pitch was, let's just talk about things, not in great detail, but things that we can have a conversation about that piss us off. And then you countered with, yeah, but maybe we should talk about some things that spark joy and satisfaction. And okay, fine. I guess we we can't be, you know, 
beacons of negativity all the time. But I have a hunch that the list for things that piss you off is going to be a little larger than the list of things that bring you joy. It's easier to be pissed off than it is to be happy. So ground rules, nerd or nerd adjacent type stuff, preferably stuff that we can have a conversation about. We're not just going to be like, Nazis are bad. I hate Nazis. They piss me what? off. Because well, ha- like, what conversation on. can you have around that? I don't know. I could play devil's advocate, but I won't. You could. It's because you're a Nazi supporter. Ah, no, no, no. There's no in between. <laughs> you know what? That's one thing where I would say there probably are really only two absolutes. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're either a Nazi supporter or you're a good person. Those are your two options. Yeah. Anyway, uh, do you have a list? Um, this, it, here's a funny thing. Cause I mean, one of the things that, uh, I used to do a lot was just like fly off the handle about everything all the time. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I used to work tech support with you overnights, man. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a steady stream of like pun intended quite literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stream of consciousness. You know what pisses me off? <laughs> and it's kind of like, I like the nostalgia because we don't do that anymore. Like we, we <sighs> gripe about some stuff here and there, but like we're, we almost too old and don't have the energy for it. But now's the time. Damn it. Well, here's the thing. I, I've been, I, cause I, we, we had a little discussion about, you know, like preparing a little bit before we sit down to have these conversations. And I did, I sat down I, I, I got, I have, I have a notepad that I, I wrote some things down on. None of them make any damn sense. And I, 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 I guess therapy is working because there's really nothing that, piss- now I do have, a, I do have one gripe <laughs> that I can talk about. Um, but like normally it would be like, I got 10 things right off the top of my head that I can be pissed off about. I don't even get angry in traffic anymore. What the fuck is wrong with you? I don't know, man. Honestly, I don't get angry. You know who gets angry in traffic? My wife. If you're listening, honey, I love you. You are nasty when driving. Do you remember the old Goofy cartoon uh, where, you know, he's a mild-mannered good citizen. He gets in a car and he's, ah, get off the road. My taxes pay for that and get out of my way. Uh, Yeah. yeah. That's my dad. (laughs) So... Uh, here is a thing that pisses me off. Do you remember when we first started using computers, like actual PCs, when we had 640 by 480 pixels or 800 by 600? Just you saying, know? Yeah, I remember like way less than that, but yes. Okay, well, around the time that Windows 3 or Windows 1.0, 2.0, whatever, the first one that sort of hit was Windows 3.0. Okay, so you're talking actual PCs here. Yeah, PCs with with a graphical user interface. You've got... Let's let's for the benefit of the doubt say that we've gone with like SVGA and we've got 800 by 600. Okay. All right. So you've got a window, right? And it's yay big and it's got borders that are 10 pixels wide. You can see them. You know where they are. You can find them with your mouse and you can drag your window around. There's a title bar that has some kind of definition where you can figure out this is where I grab it to drag it around. I currently have a monitor in front of me that is 3,400 by 1,444 or whatever the hell it is. It's a 2K ultra wide. I have windows on it that the borders are one pixel wide. Trying to resize a window is an exercise in extreme frustration. I'm almost to the point where I'm going to have to grab the fucking magnifier in order to find the edge of the window. So do you run your UI scale just at 100% then? I think it's at 125. It's at the the recommended. Mm. Because otherwise, you end up with, okay, I can actually find my windows now, but my text is the size that my grandma needs to read. And there's only three words on the entire screen. So there's also, there's there's sort of bloat. The title bars have become um, like, hey, we're going to put a bunch of stuff in the title bar. Right? And I do actually have some applications at work where I have to find the one square inch that I can actually drag it. Otherwise, I'm opening something. So my gripe is that like we have all of this screen real estate now. Let's go ahead and use some of it. We don't need to have like hyper flat windows. Give me the option, at least. Make it easy. 
let me, you know what? Let let me, as an old guy, you know, the the one that you're most of the time trying to sell stuff to, let me have my Windows 3.1 interface in Windows 11. Mm-hmm. Let me let me bring out the nostalgia. Bring back Clippy. <laughs> Hot take. Clippy wasn't that bad. I liked Clippy. Did you know that Clippy was actually Windows 1.0? Micro, or was it Microsoft Bob? Microsoft Bob had... Microsoft Bob was where all of that stuff came out of because they never released it, but they did give us the dog and the wizard and Clippy. Yes. Did you, did you ever work anywhere where they did the... Because uh, there was a thing that they released for a while where there was like a security suite that a lot of businesses, small businesses, mostly picked up where when you log in, the wizard would fly across the screen and go... Welcome to so and so. You have to agree to the following agreement, and then you'd click on it and he'd fly across the screen again and he'd give you another dialogue box. No. Oh, it was so annoying. I just want to do my work and it's and of course you've got like the the worst video card that you can imagine. So he's going chunk, chunk, chunk as he goes across the screen. I have a similar gripe, kind of related. Uh, and this was spurned by the recent interface changes for Google Chrome. Google Chrome has interface changes? Uh, they shipped an update uh, just sort of over the new year that reorganized a whole bunch of shit. And my gripe with that, like it's one thing to make things, you know, oh, let's let's change the style. We're going to, you know, make it look visually to fit in whatever the, you know, OS theme is or whatnot. Okay, I'm fine with that. Typography changes, color palette changes, rounded corners versus square corners. For the most part, I don't give a shit. But when you start reorganizing things in menu systems and submenu systems, Windows 11 is terrible for this and that like you can't right click on something and see everything. Now you got to right click, get one fly out, then open the other fly out. They don't even look the same, yada, yada, yada. Like I use browsers for a living, developer, Google have built a suite of tools that they've encouraged businesses to use for their day and day operations. Everything from Google Sheets to Google Docs to whatever. Your browser is a core work function. It is the office. Quit fucking with shit and fucking with shit to make it worse. There's nothing more difficult for me than like trying to walk somebody who's not technical through something, right? There's this weird balance between the only way I can get them to do it easily now is to give them some arcane set of keystrokes. Because... You go into the menu system to look for something. View page source isn't F12. even in the main net menu right now. Oh, you can open bad. your developer tools and look at inspector and do it that way. Right. Or you can actually still right click somewhere and usually get it, but it's not in that main menu setup like it used to be. Why? Oh man, I don't know. So yes, I have to ask them, are you on a Mac or are you on a PC? So I know which keystroke to regurgitate to them. It's like walking somebody through using DPS back in our Dell tech support days. Okay, well, what you need to do is hit, you know, shift alt F8, then tab twice F2, space space, asterisk, shift alt F4, (laughs) type in a couple of fields, tab, 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 enter, enter, control C. (laughs) Command C. Do you see a big blue E or a big green N? Oh, a A big big black black nothing. nothing. (laughs) I'm going to have to ask you to turn the computer on. (laughs) I... Brought that video up and rewatched it like less than a week ago. Three dead trolls in a baggie. Those guys were genius. Yeah. Uh, there's two versions of that skit. One that was like produced in a studio and one that was done live on stage. The live on stage one I enjoy more. Yeah. Uh, it's a guy by the name of Westborg, part of Three Dead Trolls in a Baggie. Used to be deadtroll.com. They don't exist anymore as far as I can tell. Canadian guys. But if you just do a search for Internet Help Desk live on youtube you will find like a 20 year old version of that live like you know the joke in that was like you know nothing beats the adrenaline buzz of configuring some idiot's adsl modem (laughs) even though he's running you know windows 3.1 on a 386 with four megs of ram so that's how much it dates the video (laughs) but it is so relevant it's so accurate Oh, yeah. I used to run that video for every training class I ever did when I was doing training in like call centers and tech support. Yeah, this is your life now. Yep. I'm a pro. I'm a vet. Hell, I've been here eight months. <laughs> uh, I would I would like to. So I wrote two things down on my list. Um, 
The first one, change for the sake of change, which is exactly what you're describing. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when they made the switch from, um, you know, a menu where you change things under file options mm -hmm. to now it's three dots? Mm -hmm. What do those three dots mean? When, when did we get instructions on three dots is the menu? Nah. <laughs> Give me three, five bees for a quarter, we'd say. But the important thing to remember is that I had an onion tied to my belt, which was the style at the time. That's the only real thing I wrote on the list. The other thing is just the inside of my own brain, which was more or less facetious. Yeah, I fucking hate that too. Fuck you and your brain, man. Some days, you know what? Like I'll, I find myself... Um, I've, I proposed something to Cindy the other day that we should take a week and just not participate in social media. Cause I find myself when my phone goes bing, which I ran over my phone, by the way, did I mention that? You did not. Yeah. So when I was traveling for a funeral a couple of weeks ago, I borrowed a car. I had my phone in my hand. I put it down on my lap to, you know, fiddle with something. And then I got out to, out of the passenger seat to get in the driver's seat. Didn't realize I dropped my phone and I ran over it. So that was the impetus for me asking, by the way, the other day about cell phones. They are, they are on the way. Um, Did you end up going with the Moto options? No. Uh, uh, Google Pixel 7a is good enough. Our, our bill goes down by $9 a month. And we just have to, it was basically, yes, we promised to stay customers for two years. And the phone is $0 down and $0 per month. And the plan is cheaper. So. It's hard to argue with that. Yeah. You can bitch about being locked into a contract, but you know, whatever. I, I mean, when we're not locked in, it's literally, if we want to yeah. leave, we just got to pay up. Yeah. yeah you got to pay off the rest of the two years all at once, which we don't have an option. Like we have one carrier that works in town. So, so it is what it is anyway. So the reason that I, I again, like tangent all over the place that I said, we should like get away from, from social media is because I find myself every time my phone goes bang, I completely lose focus on whatever I was talking about. Cause I'm like, Oh, I got to look. I have noted and I have for almost ever, my notifications are on for my text messages and mm -hmm. my phone rings. Uh, when somebody calls me, that's it. No email notifications. I do have, uh, notifications set up for direct messages in discord, but that's it. So you must really hate it when I send you like 17 messages in a row during the day. Not at all, because, well, A, I've probably just got it on on the computer in front of me. But even if it's, you know, the weekend or whatever, it, I haven't been bombarded by 72 notifications the hour leading up to that. Oh, fair enough. S so much better. I would like to point out, uh, and I would like to make an observation. Um, I don't think that you ever left the call center. The reason I say this to give people uh, at home some context, I I set up Foundry on my computer. Now I did it. Uh, I have both the uh, the SSH tunnel and Foundry running on uh, a Java node. I, I, like I don't know what the terminology is. It's like node.js dash slash folder something something. Right. It was very much Google and copy and paste. Mm -hmm. Um. But like I'm, I, I'm technical, but I'm I'm no longer knowledgeable about this kind of stuff. So before I set that up, I ran Foundry, and I turned on UPnP because I don't know if my router supports it. And I asked you, hey, can you see if you can get to this place? And you, you know, sent me a response a few moments later. You know, blocked by each. Okay, UPnP doesn't work. I'll have to do something else. I was actually just like cleaning up some stuff at work. I was waiting for things to upload and stuff while I was playing with that. In the next 30 seconds, I got 17 texts from you. It, you need to set up port forwarding. Here's a link to that. And you need to do this. And these are the ports you need for Foundry. And here's a link to that. You've probably already looked at this. But if it's not that, then you should try this. And it was literally like this fucking essay of things that I should try. I'm like, dude, I, it literally has been installed and running for 30 seconds. <laughs> Besides my wife and my D and D crew, you're the only person I talk to. Again, <laughs> is that pathetic? I ah. mean, you guys be the judge. I, it was funny too because as <laughs> uh, like ten seconds after I said, "Dude, I think I'm going to make the jump to Foundry," you had sent me a list, a text file that you had obviously prepared beforehand of 
here are some handy modules that you'll probably now, need. Now, that's and not entirely true. It was it was quite a while because I'd gone to work that morning when I go into the office and Tanya's going to work. Sometimes I'm getting dropped off like just after seven o'clock. I wouldn't, I'm not really on the clock till about 830. So it's like, you know what? Telson said he's making the jump to Foundry. <laughs> this should be helpful. And it was. I, I, I again. This is one of those things where I got to say, like, I'm you want to appreciate it, fucker. <laughs> I did eventually appreciate it, but it's like I'm not. Did ready I mention for this. I hate the inside of your brain? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it was just like I'm not. I'm not ready for this. I literally have just made the the, the decision to do this. I have gotten approval from the the, the spousal unit to actually make a purchase. You know, she 17 has released- minutes later, Foundry's running. I got 31 modules installed. I'm using <laughs> shit that you've never even heard of, and it's fucking amazing. Uh, I I would love to say that's not true. <laughs> you would be lying. I would. It wasn't 17 minutes. It was at least 18, but it was pretty quick. <laughs> I, I I discovered because one of the things that they have done, and I, I really do appreciate this. It it. Reminds me of the way that they set up Qnix. Remember Qnix? Mm-hmm. Windows operating system on a floppy disk, um, where Foundry itself is really just a web page. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can use it just as is, but it's not super handy for anything specific. And it's the right way to do it, right? You you add the modules that you need to do the thing that you do. And there's, you know, three or four modules sometimes that do similar things in a different way. And you find the one that's a fit for you. Yeah. Um, The one thing that I'm not sure how it's working, but it is working, so I'm not going to play with it, is when I drag PCs from one place to another um, with basic Foundry, like with before I installed modules, it would show you the stuff that was behind walls. Because when you move, right, it goes around the walls. When I move you, I drag you across the walls. Yep. And it would go updating vision the whole way. And even when you turn off immediate updates, it would still go there and it would show it as explored area. And I have three different modules that are supposed to fix that, but any one of them doesn't fix it, but all three of them seem to. I'm not sure. It's it's like you're balancing teacups on top of teacups and it's like, okay, it's balanced. Nobody breathe. <laughs> Going back to your change for the sake of change thing. I know that this isn't change for the sake of change i know why they're doing it and i fucking hate it Mm. the idea of taking a simple idea and ruining it with bullshit complication now for me to complain about overcomplicating something is saying something i am the king of overcomplicating things but it's my own shit i'm overcomplicating and the specific thing that pisses me off this week Tim Horton's roll up contests. You remember when you could roll up the rim to the cup and everybody fucking loved it? Yeah. They haven't done that for like three or four years. Now it's all app based. You go through drive through uh, to Tim Horton's, you boop your phone, you can do your shit like that. You know, you got fucking old grandma who's at Tim Horton's four times a day as, well, hey, for the grandmas out there, they're tech savvy. Power to you. Knows. But to the average grandma who's still using a flip phone only because they have to. You've robbed them of that experience. And I could say, oh, you know, it's about making sure that employees and restaurants aren't taking advantage of it and steal the cups. Nobody cares. You know, you weren't, as Tim Hortons, benefiting from that contest because, you know, people won. It was just something that people did and talked about. Yes, I know you're doing the app thing because you want to collect and sell data and all of that malicious bullshit now. I get it. Bring back the fucking roll up to rim cups. You're printing unique cups for it. It's not like they're giving you the regular cups and not running a special batch. There's new cups. It's got the big arrow, but it doesn't point to the rim because you can't roll that up anymore. It's pointing to a phone. It's not roll up the rim to win anymore. It's scan your personal data in so we can sell it to Chinese karma farmers. You know, and you're printing the part of the cup that would be under the thing that you're rolling. You can still roll it up and you're going to see the ink from the rest of the cup go up under that rolled part of the rim. So you're not saving money because you're printing special cups anyway. I'm a techie. I'm into tech. Fuck you and your app-driven roll-up contests. Is there anything more Canadian than complaining about Tim Hortons and whatever they're doing this week? Take off, eh, you hoser? It uh, ties my knickers in a knot. Gets my gourd up. Yeah. 
frosts my onions. I uh, I haven't been to Tim Hortons. I, we had one uh, at work. Like we literally in our cafeteria, we have a Tim Hortons kiosk, and we used to go there twice a day. Um, and since working from home, I just don't go anymore. I'm I'm not and making my own coffee at home. I I'm now no longer interested in Tim Hortons coffee. It's bad. Yeah. It's funny. I actually use the Tim Hortons instant coffee at home. Yeah. Yeah. The combination of it and like coffee mate, not the, the liquid coffee mate, just the plain powdered stuff, not extra sweetener or flavor or anything in it. It's my preferred coffee now, Mm. but I'm going to have to stop drinking it because of what they've done to the roll up game. Like it just used to be one of, you know, this is the most Canadian thing ever. But like it was that and McDonald's Monopoly. You looked forward to this shit every year. Did you ever win? No. When you did win, it was almost an inconvenience because it's like, oh, I got the free coffee thing. I'm not going to be that asshole that goes through drive through and it's like, oh, by the way, I've got a free coffee thing. <laughs> no, you're just like, you pay for it anyway. You, you throw it in the glove compartment of your car. You forget about it until the contest is expired. Mm-hmm. But you still look forward to it. Well, I mean, I, you only ever flipped the thing over and went, well, it's not Park Place and it's it's whatever. It's not Boardwalk, yeah. so it's not worth it. Yeah, with Monopoly, it was like that. Is you get the one, right? It'd be like the first time you, you went during Monopoly, you get one of those. And then yeah. it'd be like, ooh, is this the one that everybody gets? Or is this the one that, you know, nobody gets? Yeah. And you'd have to check because they'd change it every year. Yeah, and you you don't, you just don't know. But it was an experience. There was a big scandal about that one. Yeah. Um, the people who were actually printing the McDonald's pieces were handing them out to their relatives. Yeah. Yeah. So. And yes, I get that. And going to the digital app based shit, you could argue that maybe it mitigates some of that while creating other problems. Oh, the Tim Hortons one, there's no excuse for. Yeah. None. But it was an experience thing. Like you take the kids to McDonald's. I know you don't have kids, but like we had kids growing up during the heyday of the McDonald's monopoly thing, they knew they couldn't win shit anyway, or if they did, like they couldn't claim it, but they loved the experience of getting the things and sticking them on. And yes, McDonald's still does that now, but it's all like, yes, you get a couple of properties, but it's, Oh, go to the website and put in this code to enter, you know, the online contest, collect your data, monetize that shit that way. And it's just, It's not that it just ruined it for me, but it's... It's dumb. It's dumb. And I think you, as a business, some shithead MBA with no fucking clue how things really work, overlooked just how cherished that stupid, meaningless shit was. It was a part of your identity. People legit looked forward to it. It's like pumpkin spice lattes at fucking Starbucks. Most people, honestly, they have them once or twice a year and they're like, oh, yeah, I remember why I didn't drink this last year. And then they get excited about it next year. Ooh, it's out a week earlier than last year. And they have their pumpkin spice latte. They can talk about it around the water cool and say they did it. The kids can get excited about it. Don't fucking ruin that for the sake of what? What are you making off of our data? Surely you've got our data anyway. Well, he, yeah, probably. Here's a funny thing that I, I think about, because of course we're, we're complaining about it. We, it really is old men yelling at clouds. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder, because there's a lot of stuff that we did when we were sort of in our you know mid-20s to mid-30s that like my parents at very least went, ah, oh, this is stupid and it'll never catch on. And of course it's stuck around. So I wonder how much of the way things are today is going to become the new normal. I mean, there, there's a phrase you haven't heard in at least six months, right? This is the new normal. Mm, the paradigm has shifted. Oh my God. Hey, shift your fucking trachea is what I'm going to do. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I get it. And it will be the new normal because people using it today won't have experienced the other stuff. That's like dialing a rotary phone. There was there was a tactile sensation to that that was, oh, uh, what, what I was going to say is those MBAs are looking at it. Your emotions. Do not show up in my spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. And that's that's just the way it is. It's like I, I've had arguments with like CEO level bosses at various times in my career to say, like, if you do this, your productivity will go down. And they're like, Well, but look at the look at the calculations and this and that and the utilization. I'm like, when you piss people off, 
they work slower. That's the way it is. Study after study has shown that working longer and harder doesn't actually produce more. It produces less. Mm -hmm. But you you can't convince people, right? Because they just look at, well, someone else is doing the work, so they will work at 100% capacity the whole time. Yeah. But that, that, that marketing sort of driven stuff, like, you know, there's this, oh, we're looking for the next big thing. And I was like, you've got this big thing that you don't need to spend money marketing. You do it every year. People are looking forward to it. Don't fuck it up. There's a uh, there's a desire, I think, for some people that the line must go up. Yeah. Profit is not enough. It must grow. But I would argue that, you know, if you're really KPI inclined, you're all about the analytics. Surely when you fuck this up and you see your numbers go down, that has to mean something to you. And they do go down. They do. But the thing is, is that then you hide it from everybody and you double down on it because you can't you can't admit you're wrong. My God. Do you remember New Coke? Do you me- can you imagine if New Coke came out today? They'd go, oh, no, New Coke is definitely better. It just, just needs time to catch on. We'll go another year. I went shopping at Walmart over the weekend, and they had something called, like, Coke Spiced in a few different flavors. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if it's not Captain Morgan Spiced, I'm not interested. Mm, I didn't get it, because um, I'm really trying to avoid any... Sugary drinks? Excess sugar, uh, as I say, as I'm you know, downing the cider here. Uh, that's alcohol. Alcohol. I've been drinking a lot of a lot of diet stuff, and I'm even trying to cut off of that. But <sighs> yeah, at least what they didn't do is, and they learned their lesson. They haven't stopped selling Coke Classic. They're like, "Ooh, we fucked this up. Let's not do that again." They learned from that mistake. They'll try new shit. Coke Stardust. It tastes like dirt, or you know. <laughs> Mystery dirt. Everybody, you know, it's one of those flavors that everybody thinks it tastes a little bit like something else. I get that it's meme worthy. It's like the Grimace milkshake bullshit, right? Going viral on TikTok. That's fine. And when I don't like it, Coke is there for me to buy. Regular Coke if I want it. Do you know why? Do you, did you ever hear the story of why New Coke came out? My brain is so full of stupid, useless trivia. Um, they brought out New Coke because in blind taste tests, Coke always loses to Pepsi. Mm-hmm. Always. Coke loses to Diet Coke. People drink Coke because they like the way the label looks and they like the way it – it's the advertising. Literally, Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan drinks Coke. Uh, Michael Jordan doesn't drink Coke, Mm -hmm. everybody. And I think that has changed somewhat now. Um, The shift from you know cane sugars to, to high fructose corn syrup and stuff like that, they all taste different than they used to. And I think it's a much more common sentiment now that real Coke just tastes better than everything else. I don't like Coke. Yeah. I prefer, I'm, my, when I'm drinking a cola, I drink Diet Pepsi. Yeah. For a while, I was all about Diet Pepsi tastes better than Diet Coke. I think so. I've pulled away from that. I, I drink Diet Pepsi for uh, probably about two years and it just got to the point where it's like, nah, we can't. It's just not. And going back to Coke, and I do like their new take on the zero sugar stuff because they've done it smart, right? Like the weird thing about Diet Coke versus Coke is Diet Coke never tasted like Coke. It was its not own even, thing. And there yes. are people that like it. And when they tried to, they almost knew Coked it, where it was like, let's have Coke zero and, and scale back on the diet. And there was a big population of people that were like, no, I'd like Diet Coke. Don't take Diet Coke away from me. Now they've gone with the option of Coke. What was Coke Zero? They've just turned it into Coke Zero Sugar, and they're doing the smart thing. This is just Coke, but with no calories. They've tried to get the taste as close as they can, and they keep they, they keep turning knobs to get it a little bit closer. They're aligning the branding with regular Coke now, so that eventually, because you know the, the the modern generation of people, I would say kids, Zoomers, younger even are actually smarter about the kind of shit they're putting into their bodies now. And they're looking for smarter choices like a zero sugar soda or pop. And um, Coke's just like, hey, yeah, we've got Coke and we've got the other Coke that doesn't have calories in it now. Same great drink. They turn up the caffeine in it a little bit, which is really smart. And they're not trying to do the Pepsi Max type thing or Pepsi Ice. You remember Pepsi Ice? Do you remember Pepsi Crystal? Clear? Yeah. Pepsi Crystal Clear. Pepsi? Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> my, I have a funny story about that. Uh, my grandmother, God rest her soul, um, 
drank rum and coke her pretty much i think she started drinking in like her 50s um and what she would drink was she would drink rum and pepsi um and she her doctor passed away so she got a new doctor this was back when there were still doctors in canada um at this point i think she was 85 give or take and she was drinking uh, probably too much from a, as the standpoint of you know statistically you shouldn't drink that much but she's 85 right so her doctor says you know it, you probably should drink a little bit less alcohol than you are um and you know pepsi is bad for you uh, some of some of the what's bad for you is the color try the pepsi clear or you should drink it with a clear beverage you know like like water or or sprite or seven up so she tried pepsi clear and she tried that she bought a case like a, a, a 24 uh, a flat pack and she went through the flat pack and then said you know what i'm 85 my doctor is 35 <laughs> when he could when he turns 85 he can tell me what to do <laughs> I think if you make it to 85, like you've earned the, and it's, Hey, it's, you've won the lottery. First of all. Yeah. Do what you want. Once you've hit 85, like you don't need to change anything. What you've been do doing has been working. Yeah. You know, exactly. And that was, that was the, yeah. the approach. It was like, whether you got 10 years left or seven years left at that point, what does it matter? Live your life. I don't know. She, she lived to like in her mid nineties. She had her like a leg amputated at one point. And we were like the whole rest of the family, like the doctor came in and said, like, we, you've got two choices. Either we can cut off your leg because there's you know, problems and it's going to, it's going to poison you, um, you know, or you can just slowly pass away. And of course we're like, oh my God, what kind of decision are we going to make? Blah, blah, blah. And, and she's like, what decision? Cut off my damn leg. I can live without a leg. Carry on. She still had more energy than I do. I mean, she was, she was going, she was it was 92 or 93. She's got one leg. She's in a wheelchair and she's still calling up the handy bus to take her out to the old folks home so that she can play piano for them. Right. She's the oldest person in the room and she's the entertainer who is coming in on her own to entertain the old people. I mean, it's just, ah, uh, that's fantastic. She, they don't make them like that anymore. No, no, she was unstoppable. So we didn't really get to anything that brings us joy. No, I got a, I got a few things there. Um, there is one thing that pisses me off that I do want to talk about because I think we're going to do a whole episode on this at one point. And this is very much like the epitome of old men yelling at clouds. It's also taking advantage of like, you know, AI buzz bullshit. I miss written articles. Oh my God. Oh my God. The entire internet now is written by the a by an AI. Yeah, you either get either like AI generated text medium or the stuff that is actually created by real people is buried in video. And I get why they do it. You can't make a website anymore, throw some unobtrusive banner ads on it and even break even. The price that we're paying as a civilization, all this information that is lost, you know, thinking of the think of the, the loss of the Library of Alexandria. And it's happening before our very eyes, this knowledge that isn't centralized, everything from repairing cars and washing machines to significant critiques and art and culture, and mm -hmm. they can't keep the lights on. Well, there's the other, the thing that pisses me off about that is if you search for something, um, and the fact that, you know, searching for it has become synonymous with, synonymous with just Google it. Try and search the internet with anything other than Google these days. Well, and you, we're almost at the point where you have to now. You know what? I use Bing more this year than I've used at any point an alternative to Google since like fucking AltaVista and Lycos days. Wow. You know? The, but what happens is that you search for something, you get like 75 things, but they're all the same thing. They are. Yeah. It's literally the same text on every website. The AI generated clickbait stuff. You got 19 pages to a fucking article so that you can constantly click on it to refresh new ads, new ads, new ads. It's yeah. all like, hey, here's this clickbaity headline. Okay, maybe once in a while it's like, oh, I'm kind of interested in that. And it's it's like the old school approach to like recipe sites where you would yeah. read like 
here's my entire backstory and about this time when I was four years old when my grandma taught me how to make this thing and blah, 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 blah. It's enough content to insert some ads in between it. And then at the bottom of the page, you'd have the recipe, which was the only thing you gave a shit about. Yep. And now it's, it's here's, here's paragraphs of bullshit. You know, it's like, oh, here's a theory about what's going to happen in the next Avengers movie. And it's 17 pages of telling me what happened in the movies that I've already seen. Mm-hmm. And then they get to the, you know, snippet of text, which is literally just recycling the headline. There's no no foundation about it at all. I fucking hate it. I, I, I want to go back to the old ways and I can't. Which brings me to my first thing that brings me joy and satisfaction. And that is the fact that it is a modern day fucking miracle that Wikipedia is a thing. The rest of the Internet has gone to complete shit. And here's Wikipedia just doing their thing. They recently downgraded, the reason I'm talking about it, they just recently downgraded uh, the reliability rating of CNET. Uh, because CNET started publishing AI content recently. Yeah. And listen, Wikipedia is not perfect. I remember a time where it was like, you shouldn't use this. You should use proper encyclopedias and proper this and yada yada. You know what? I would say that 99% of the time, Wikipedia is probably your best source for information. It is. A blind test actually showed that it was more accurate than the Encyclopedia Britannica. I thought that I had an argument with my dad about this, where he's like, you, you gotta, you got to use a real encyclopedia because real people have written that. I'm like, who do you think writes Wikipedia? Yeah. Right? I mean, like, there's that one guy who's responsible for like a half a billion words or whatever. But isn't an interesting thing. Here's an entire page on random subject you scroll down to the bottom and here's all the cited sources and the other places that i can go look that may be more reliable yeah so if i want something that has more cred if i'm writing a fucking essay at school go to wikipedia first get the gist of it find the cited shit go read that throw that in your bibliography you're good to go the fact that it doesn't serve you ads yes they do once a year or so give you that banner message. Hey, Wikipedia needs you could use some donations. If you look at sort of Wikimedia's uh, financial reports, you're like, oh, wow, they make a lot of money. Why are they asking for so much money? I mean, first of all, the server costs to just keep this thing oh. afloat. Second of all, if you massive. look at how they spend their money, like the the outreach, they, they do organize conferences for contributors and, and stuff to keep this thing going. And they're smart. They put money away, they tuck it away, they calculate their burn rate, and they're like, we always want to have enough free money so that if all of our funding stops today, we've got several years to keep the lights on and figure it out. God, I wish our governments would do that. Right? So here's something. Do you remember Maddox, the best Best page page in in the universe? Yes, it's still up. It, It was updated in August of this year. I mean, it was... Like August, August, and then the previous one was in 2020. So it's not like it's getting lots of updates, but I was very surprised to see like a an, an reasonably recent update. Um, I'm not entirely certain that uh, he's relevant in the modern day. No, and, and let's be honest, like a lot of things of that time, it hasn't aged all that well. No, it hasn't. But I would be lying if I didn't say that I've spent an inordinate amount of time back in the day on that site. And then every four or five years since going back and replaying the hits. Yeah. Yep. Just like uh, Homestar Runner and uh, Chronicles of George. Um, I mentioned Acts of Gord the other day. Yeah. Uh, like this is just all like things from the ancient history of the Internet that are worth looking at. And you got to cherish them, got to support them, because more and more they're just disappearing and getting back to Wikipedia. I'm not one to say, give your money away. But the next time you see that banner pop up, Wikipedia every year, help support us, keep us running. Wikipedia needs you. If you've got a few extra bucks, take an honest look at how much you've used it in the past. What Wikipedia has done for you. It's worth it. Throw them a bone. Even if you only do it once in your life, 10 bucks. I have no affiliation with the Wikipedia. 
I've just every year come to realize and appreciate it for what it is. The inshittification of the rest of the internet's happening all around us. And here they are doing their thing still. Yes, the, the organization and foundation around it is a little bit bigger. And I'm sure that brings business problems to the table. But they haven't been whoring themselves out for clickbait revenue. They haven't been running ads. They're not. They're still actively trying to kill the type of content that a lot of other platforms welcome. Mm. You know, stuff that is advertorial in nature. Yes. Yeah. So I would. I would like to to bring up uh, the fact that you've basically compared GeoCities to the Library of Alexandria. And I don't think you're wrong. No, I mean, yes, there was, you know, a whole, uh, fuck, my, my very first website way back in the day would have been a GeoCities website that was publicly accessible. I did some BBS shit back in the day long before that, but accessible website, type in a URL, anybody could access it online. It was a GeoCities site. I had, I was doing fan sites for fucking books that I was reading. I was into like weird RPG shit, like text-based sort of RPGs, not like MUDs and stuff. I did the MUD stuff too, but like the equivalent of Yahoo chat role-playing kind of stuff. You, know, you think oh. about the Discord-based or IRC-based D&D kind of stuff, like early versions of that. Did you ever meet Blood Ninja? You? No. Do you know who... Did, do you, do you remember the, the guy? I, I never, I don't even know if it was a real thing. It was the kind of thing that would show up in Twitter now as screenshots. And it was just doing, uh, you know, basically uh, like sex chat. Only he didn't, like he would, I don't know if it was a he or a she. They would log into a thing and, they, and the other person would be like, oh, we're going to do sexy things. And he's like, I pull out my plus two bastard sword and cut your head off. Or stupid things like that where it's just like completely out of character. And the other person, more often than not, would try to continue with the role playing. And he's just like taking it off the rails. That's funny. No, I hadn't actually run into that. No, it was it was a it was a thing that people used to like keep sending me copies of. And I'm like, yeah, this is amusing and everything. But why are you sending it to me? I don't know. Maybe I just give up that kind of vibe. Do you have anything else that brings you joy? <sighs> My wife. Are we going to have an in-depth conversation debating the pros and cons of your wife here? I don't, I don't think we can, but I, no. I did kind of need to give that shout out. Um, Cause it is true. Um, I don't know if we can, have, like, I don't, I, I don't have nerdy things that bring yeah. me joy anymore. Nerdy things now, like some things bring me satisfaction when they work, when things just work. Right. Foundry did it this weekend. Like I was, I was happy about that. Yeah. Nerdy stuff just either frustrates me or it's, I, I want, we had this conversation, I think, when I bought my computer without building it myself, where it's like, I don't, I don't need to have my, my hands on things anymore. I just want things to work. Turn in your card, man. I know. I know. I am no longer a nerd. I am now just an old man. Shout out to my wife. I have to do it now. You bring me great joy. I love you, baby. I do have one other thing that I want to just call out. Uh, it's not nerdy per se, but it kind of is. Uh, I shit on Hollywood a lot. I did have actually a gripe thing that I skipped over about Hollywood that I'm not going to get into. Yesterday, we watched the first episode of um, Shogun. I don't know if you've started into that at all. Nope. Uh, we're only an episode in. I'm really enjoying what I see so far. But what I love is that Hollywood, a small portion of it, finally having the balls to produce Hollywood quality, Hollywood budget content and film it in foreign and native languages, dubbing it with English rather than filming the English version of it. Shogun obviously uh, focused on Japan. Mm hmm. I don't speak Japanese. I wouldn't even say that I'm like in tune with the Japanese zeitgeist. But what I can say as an observer is that so much of what I associate with not the bigger picture Japanese culture, but the 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 nuance of being Japanese is the language. When you say things in the native tongue, they sound different than the translation. 
the emotions feel different. In some cases, there's an aggressiveness to saying something, you know, hey, how was your weekend? It, it just sounds different, right? It's like the, the jokes about German where it's, you know, 19 million letter long word that sounds like you're really angry all the time. It's past the sugar. Or there's some things that are you know, very, very elegant. And I think when you translate that into English, the rhythm, the, the percussive nature of the language gets lost. And that is so important to conveying the emotions that I think are culturally appropriate for the, the material. Uh, another recent example-ish, uh, 2022, did you see the movie Prey? It was actually a low-budget yep. Predator prequel. Mm -hmm. um, there is an English version of it, but there's what should be the definitive version of it, which was the Comanche version. So much better. They are more difficult to watch. Mechanically speaking, you have to read the subtitles, but you'd lose nothing in doing it. You gain so much. I think, I, to, to go back to Prey, I think Prey was the best Predator movie that's ever been made. Yeah. By far. And now I haven't watched them end to end, like in both languages. Uh, mm. Manchu version, I've seen a lot of clips. I've seen side-by-side -side comparisons between scenes, and the English dub just doesn't touch the, the version, the Comanche version. Like, it just, it's superior in every way. And yes, it's hard to uh, be a disengaged consumer of that media. You know, mm. you, you can't just be whipping out your phone and, and, you know, crushing some candy or whatever it is you do. You have to be more actively engaged but I also think that's part of why I enjoy it more. Probably. I, I, I will say that it's important to note that there are some people who would have difficulty consuming that sure. kind of content. Absolutely. You know, because I watched the English version and I, I still thought that it was a really good movie. Like oh, I thought, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not a drastically different movie. Mm -hmm. But the ability to convey the right feeling, the right shit, I found at least works better when executed properly, mm -hmm. uh, leaning into the, the foreign language or, or native tongue. That doesn't mean that what I'm saying is, you know what, fuck Hollywood, just go watch a bunch of foreign movies because like what Hollywood movies bring to the table, sometimes in terms of production value and, and even just budget is hard to replicate in a lot of foreign markets. There's, I'm sure, great movies out there that you should give a chance to. But when you put it all together, the Hollywood budget, the, the most talented cinematographers in the world, the best writers in the world, some of the most talented actors being able to act in their native tongue. Like so many of the people that we think of as amazing actors are doubly amazing because they're acting in their second language a lot of the time. Uh -huh. And they're so much more amazing when you get them paddle their talents in their native language. It's fantastic. And I just, this isn't that, you know, watching those movies brings me joy. It does. But it's that some people in Hollywood finally have the balls to do it and do it right. And in a couple of instances, that Prey movie, which was a low budget movie. Really? And I think like Shogun. It. No, it didn't. But it was relatively low budget. And so far, what I've seen from Shogun, and maybe it goes off the rails and it's crap, you know, into the series a bit, but I'm only first episode in. When you do it right, man, it's amazing. Fantastic. I, I would like to make a leave a footnote um, that is sort of related to that, because um, you mentioned earlier about younger generation uh, being more careful about what they put into their bodies. Um, this, I think, is a symptom of sort of the change that is coming with younger people. There's, there's a couple of things about, uh, and I think I've mentioned it before, about the younger generation of people who that just brings me hope for the future. They're so much more inclusive. They're so much more understanding. They're, they're so much more in tune with um, not locking people out of things, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, there's, don't get me wrong. Some, some, some of the young people are still assholes. Mm-hmm. Is that just happens? Um, but the, I, the the change that I see largely is good, and that uh, I mean, it's good is good. Keep keep on doing the thing or whatever. I don't know. I'm Generation X. I'm not supposed to care. I'm just supposed to go eh, whatever. But I'm very happy to see that you know human. There's hope for humanity. We just got to get you know, just got to get past 
the people who are in charge now. Are you sure you you aren't a Nazi supporter? Because that was a very subtle way of saying a whole bunch of people need to die for the world to be a better place. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure it's okay to say the boomers have to die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's. I'm pretty sure that that's still socially acceptable. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll cut that out, right? That's not going to make the live edit. No, that'll be that little section that I pull out of the episode and put before the intro. Oh, great. Nice. Uh, there was a game called Orcs Must Die. Did you ever play that? It was kind of like a, a combination uh, first-person shooter uh, castle defense thing. Yeah. It was a neat kind of a game. I, I enjoyed it a bunch, but it, it got really repetitive real fast. Orcs Must Die. You and Chris were into playing like balloons and stuff a lot. I played like some of the early tower defense games that were like on phones when they first came out. And then I completely abandoned the genre. Bloons 5, I think, was the sort of peak of that genre. Um, and after that, it just got silly. You know, and it just it became like it, it did the same thing that uh, the triple A games did, where it's like at one time it was triple A games. Oh, my God, these are amazing. And now it's you got to pick and choose which of the triple A games you, you actually pay attention to, because most of them are not actually games. They're just slot machines. Yeah, or, you know, press A to pay your respects. Like, okay, it's cutscene, the game. Well, we're in danger of making another two-hour episode. You realize that, right? Oh, I do. Yeah. But it was a good one. I mean, I think, I think we covered a lot of ground. We, we, did some, we did some good work here. I think we may have changed the world or destroyed it. I don't know. One of the two. There's no in-between. No. Like all things. It's the internet, man. It's zero or one. You either love it or hate it. It's either the greatest thing that has ever existed or literally the worst thing ever. Those are your two options. Choose your hero. I'm going to choose to uh, go down, pour myself another drink, and reheat a bowl of chili. Mmm, chili. It's been good talking to you, man. Yeah, you too. It's it's coming up on, on dark o'clock, so I'm going to have to go and get the early bird special and, and have a nap. Because I'm old. You are old. I am old. I'm about to get older. <laughs>